grievously on the soundless citadel. A paladin's strength is faith, but I am plagued with doubt, and I fear that that doubt is starting to manifest in ways I can't control. We're a group, and groups aren't really supposed to do that. I know that you can get through this, because you're stronger than you think you are. Now is not the time for our spirits to break. We need to be at our best. I need to know how I died. You know the truth. You were deceived among smiling travelers. They hurt you. What makes you think you're not going to run again? Well, this time I'm not alone. You find yourself hugging the air, complete. But Eris took my hands, her bandits pulled me to my feet. They forced my instrument into my arms. I couldn't play, that's all my mind could think about. I couldn't make music. And the bandits, they destroyed Yorick, beat him to pieces. And they beat me almost to death and left me on the road to suffer and die. And I suppose that's... How I found the Shadowfell. And Methuselah looks at Yorick. If Yorick is gone, who is this? Throughout the vastness of the multiverse, there lies a tavern. As you approach its doors, you catch bubbles of laughter that rise and burst into cheers as colorful groups of travelers find comfort in their bonds. As you head inside, the smile of the tavern keeper greets you. They're an otherworldly being with a bluish corporeal form. They wear attire befitting of an innkeeper, and they have a large cloudy nebula for hair speckled with stars, which gently sways with their movement. Welcome to the Storyteller's Tavern, where stories are served like ale and a seat is open for you at every table. Tonight's special is the Sunless Citadel, an epic adventure of high fantasy with notes of friendship, danger, and most importantly, Oh. Will our adventure survive to descent into the dungeon? Or is there a dark and calamity taking roots far from the sun's reach? At this moment, Methuselah feels something. An emotion. A feeling of kindred connection. A certain warmth. Genuine attachment. But the interesting thing is that this feeling is not Methuselah's. It's from Yorick. And uh, I guess while we do this rest, I will attune to Yorick. Mortis waits a few couple seconds to make sure you're finished speaking, and he steps forward. That, that must have been very painful to relive, my friend. But I am proud of you for seeing it through. Sometimes the most painful parts of, our, of ourselves are the most important to revisit. I wish I had even an ounce of your strength. Oh, trust me, I, I wouldn't be as strong without all of you. Thorn's crying again, and he's hugging Methuselah. And as he hugs Methuselah, you can see that he's shaking a little bit, and he goes, If there's even a small chance that those people are still alive today, I'll make sure to take their hands, too. Being the inquisitive little tabaxi that Seeker is, they have a million questions going through their head, but they're also intelligent enough to realize now's not the darned time to ask these questions. And so they're just going to embrace their friend and whisper encouragement to them. You, you did great, Methuselah. I'm really proud of you. You're unlike anybody else I've ever met. And just, wow, I, I'm even more in awe of your, your strength and your devotion to Chrysantha after all of this. It's unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. Oh, thank you, Seeker. I am quite sure that these people who hurt me are, are dead. It's been 300 years, so I do have that on them. And uh, although Eris tried to take away the song, she couldn't. I still play. I still have my music, although I don't have my hands. So what a fool she was. The songs of generations live on in you. You are truly a master of music. I agree with Mortis. No one could ever take your music away from you. And I don't know, if they ever tried again, I know that I would get in that fight to protect you. I'm sorry that you were alone, Methuselah. Well, I'm not now, and that makes me very happy. And I do hope that my song was of some inspiration to you as well. I know we're going into quite a fight. Of 
course. I, I'd nearly forgotten in all the events. Your song was beautiful, my friend. You, you, I think you might have ex- embellished a few things about me, but nevertheless, I, I appreciate all of the compliments and my ties to Nera. I'm sure she would have loved it as well. I never thought I was going to be a big hero in an awesome song, but now everyone in Tom's Rest, they already know who I am, but they're going to know my name for a different reason, and it's maybe because I was part of an awesome song written by one of my greatest friends in the whole world and someone that I consider to be part of my family. You're not alone now, and you'll never have to be alone again. Of course, if you want to be alone for a little while, that is totally up to you, but you never have to be alone again. Well, I did spend 300 years with nothing but the shade, so I'm happy to not be alone now. Yeah, the shade doesn't sound like that much fun. No, not not, not entirely. So, should we have our rest, then? I, I think I think we've earned our rest. What does everybody else think? I know I could take a little bit of a cat nap. Thorn just nods in agreement, but he's still clinging to Methuselah. Yes, I, I suppose we do need it after all that excitement. Though, if you'll forgive me, uh, during the rests there is something I must do. And what is that? Well, you have inspired me, my friend, by facing the darkest parts of yourself. I feel that... It is my turn to delve deep within myself and finally fix what has been broken. Do you need any help with that? We're all here. Well, I I will take a moment to prepare, but I'll be sure to keep you all in my mind. Then I suppose we can take our watch? The last watch. It is quiet throughout the watch. A certain weight of what is to come permeates in the air. It's not only the weight of the future, but also the weight with him. In the corner, you can see Mortis looking at all of his equipment skeptically and seeing what he needs and doesn't need. And predominantly, you see he's clutching very closely in his hand a bundle of cloth, but you're not sure what it is. I, I know what I must do, but I fear I may lack the resolve to see it through. Why do you think that, my friend? I, I have been connected to my faith for as long as I can remember, and what if after all that has happened, what if I'm not worthy anymore? Paladin is not something that I'm aware of. Uh, we don't have paladins really in Isle or teachings and stuff. And the way that we set up ourselves, our communities, are pretty safe, and the forest itself protects us. But if I understood and have heard of other cultures, isn't it a matter of conviction? It is indeed. It requires a great amount of internal strength. I shall do all I can to summon it up. But I suppose in the end my fate is literally with the gods. Mordis holds out the bundle of cloth in his hand. And the last time I reached out to she after what happened with you, and he glances at Methuselah, I felt that my faith my connection to her was shattered literally and then he opens the the cloth and you see in three pieces what was once his holy symbol oh my yes uh, i'm not sure if it was my resolve and lack of clarity that shattered it or direct intervention of the gods but i feel that i am broken and if we are to carry on, I must find some way to heal. Well, I don't quite know about mending faith, but I do know how to fix things magically. I could fix the holy symbol for you if you need. If you could, uh, that would be incredible. I- I'm not sure if it will help my case, so to speak, but I suppose it would be a good symbol for me to hold on to while I do this. And he's gonna walk over to you and gently hold out the cloth with the holy symbol. So Methuselah will take the holy symbol, the broken holy symbol, into their mage hands, and they're going to clasp a hand over the broken pieces, and their hand is gonna glow in this bluish color, and flowers are going to start to sprout off it and in a weird way like fill it and pull it together and a light just like envelops it as when the light vanishes the holy symbol has come back together and then I'm going to 
return it to Mortis and say, Well, I hope that this can help in some way, and I hope that you can find your way through this moment of doubt, and the Lantern of Luxair can help you. Mortis reluctantly takes the holy symbol, looks at it for a moment, and then, after a moment of pause, he puts it back around his neck. Thank you, my friend. It's like I never lost it. Let us hope that my resolve is as strong as your magic. Oh, I know it is, friend. With his holy symbol repaired, Mortis looks at both Methuselah and Ergi. All right, well, I think I know what I must do. Thank you for your guidance, my friends. I'll see you on the other side. Good luck, although I know you don't need it. And then uh, Mortis is going to slowly walk towards the back of the room, away from everyone else. And the first thing he's going to do is he's going to unsheath Valkaris' greatsword and gently place it on the ground in front of him. Valkaris, grant me your indomitable will as I proceed. And then the next thing he's going to do is he's going to lay out Faith's cloak just behind the sword. Cat lady, give me strength. And then he's going to unclasp the lantern from his belt and place it on the other side. Luxair, grant me your guiding force. And then he's going to kneel in front of all of these objects and grip his holy symbol. Almighty she, goddess of death and dust, I beseech you, please, in this moment of desperation, hear my call. I recognize my failings. I viewed morality as black and white, but life as we truly live it exists in a state of gray. I recognize that it was my own failings, my own doubt, that caused the rift between us. If you would accept my prayers, it would be my honor to once again serve as your humble servant. And he's going to pray and try to reach out to divine powers within him. He's very quiet at first. Almost long enough for you to start to doubt too. But your devotion and your strength of will prevails. And that is when that warm feeling in your chest starts to emerge. Small like a candle. Then slowly growing and spreading until once again you are one with she. She has accepted you, and you are now within the embrace of her wings. For those outside, they see you kneeling down in front of those objects. They see what seems to be the enveloped of beautiful moth wings, spectral in nature, but glowing in a small ghostly light above you. It is a feeling of acceptance. She accepts your conviction, and you're now once again a full-fledged paladin. Mortis slowly rises from his kneeling stance, and he takes a moment to gather all of the items. And when he turns back to Methuselah and Erki, they see him walking with a newfound confidence. And as he walks, he slowly lets his hood that had been covering his face fall back revealing himself. I feel one again, a warrior of the Ashen Cloaks. I will do what must be done and end this terrible blight that has corrupted this land. I'll say as Mortis comes back, Methuselah notices that change in their friend and he's going to play on Yorick and the shadows at once seem to take over the magic are now in one with the magic. They don't separate or corrupt, they're an equal balance, and I play an inspiring song. Thank you, my friend. It is you who have inspired me to to find my center once again. I'm not sure where this will take me, and I know I'm not immune to making mistakes again, but I am confident that my resolve will see me through this. I will do everything in my power to protect you all. And, as a redeemed wanderer of the Ashen Cloaks, I will slay this so-called druid and restore the balance of the Sunless Citadel. Black doesn't stand a chance, my friend. 
by Valakaris's blade, he will fall. And the rest of the watch goes by with a newfound lightness in the air. I'll say before Mortis goes to sleep and we switch out for the other watch, I'll just approach Mortis and, and say, You know, my offer still stands. If you'd like, you know, someone to accompany you afterward. You and Thorn are always welcome to accompany me and Chrysantha. I know that she'd love to meet you both. Well, it would be an honor. Though once again, uh, I'm not sure how this whole encounter will go. Even though my faith in she has returned, I am still wary of what may happen with the Marquis's game. It is my hope that I can win it so that I may contain this evil and hopefully find a way to destroy it. But even so, I suppose all we can do for now is wonder. All I'll say is this. If I could be certain that my presence wouldn't put anyone in danger, it would be my honor to join you. Well, you don't have to worry too much. Chrysantha and I are travelers, so we tend to not stay in one place for a long period of time. A fair point, my friend. Fusla wakes up, Thorn, and Seeker. Uh, hi, Methuselah. Methuselah's been fiddling with Yorick the entire time, wondrously looking at the strings and watching the shadows move and playing with the keys and whatnot. Ah, oh, yes. Forgive me if this is inappropriate or rude or out of place, but you know me, I'm a curious cat. Yes, indeed. Go on. So I have about like, a million questions about what you told us earlier. Oh my. And, and it's not to cast doubt on anything you said, but you said that was 300 years ago, right? Yes, of course. But you look so young, and are you older than Mortis, technically? I don't think I know how old Mortis is. I don't think that's come up in conversation. Okay. But I suppose so, since Mortis doesn't really remember the Draconic Empire. Okay. Um, and you you were saying how that Eris had like Luxair's symbol, right? If they were a follower of Luxair, why were they like that? Luxair doesn't strike me as that type of god. The way I see it, I th she had taken that staff from an unfortunate victim. I think that if someone, you know, stole one of our signet rings and tried to pass themselves off as a follower of the cat lady to to deceive one of us, I would be I would be quite upset about that. Yes, sir. Me too, I suppose. Uh, but they weren't really good people. You know, there's a lot of dangers on the road. Which is why I really wouldn't advise going alone, like I did. Right, and I, I'm so lucky that I have you and Thorn and Mortis to guide me, because I, I don't know, I probably would have fallen for a trick like that. Suppose not. Uh, Thorn, how are you doing? Thorn is sitting just on his own, flipping through his spell book and reading it, as well as just examining it. And he looks up and goes, Huh? What? Who we were just sort of talking, um, are you doing all right? Yeah, I'm okay, I guess. I'm just, uh, I just don't know how long I'll be here, so... I was just trying to catch up on things that I've written in this, but they're mostly incomprehensible. Well, if you need, I, I, I can tell you. Or I can do it through song. Okay. Sing me the story of our journey so far. I will think I'll do that to catch Thorn up on all the things that he has missed. Honestly, I feel as Methuselah's going through that, and near the end of it, Thorn is- I say that Thorn just listens to Methuselah's song for the rest of the watch. And I will say, it is heavily embellished to make Thorn look very amazing and cool and awesome, because that's all Methuselah does when they write songs. Do you really think that today is gonna be the day that we find faith? Because I, I, I'm starting to get that feeling. Oh yes, I'm- quite sure of it. We found the garden where Faith is being held. So long as Faith hasn't, you know, wriggled out of her bonds and escaped on her own. She's almost as skilled at that as I am at those little sleight of hand things, so, you know, we learned them together, but I feel like today's the day I'm going to see her. That must be exciting. How are you feeling? Nervous, but also like a weight is going to be lifted from my chest. And with those nerves, I kind of want them to go away, so I think we should... We should wake up the others and start getting ready for that. I suppose so. I'm ready. How about you, Thorn? Yeah, I guess I'm ready too. The rest of the people are awoken. 
and you guys are preparing yourselves, eating the last of your rations that you guys have, drinking the water before you guys don't have a chance to, and you guys find yourselves just about ready to proceed. As we're gathering our stuff, preparing to leave, Mortis sheepishly walks over towards Thorn. Hello, Thorn. I was wondering if I could talk to you for a moment. Thorn is packing away his bedroll and he just silently nods. I know that the last time I spoke to you, I said some unkind things. I could blame it on emotional instability or whatever, but that would be making excuses. There was no good reason for it, and I truly am sorry for hurting you, potentially driving you back into the madness. Thorn nods and laughs and goes, It's okay. The Marquis will probably make me forget anyways. And he laughs, but then realizes that it's a little dark and goes, Thank you for apologizing. I just need some time to process a lot of things. Understandable, my friend. On the subject of the Marquis, there is something else I wanted to ask. How much do you know about this game that we're playing? Only a little bit here and there. I mean, Methuselah sang me a song last night that kind of summed everything up. Listen, I'm not gonna participate in it, but I don't know how long I'm going to be out. So, I just hope you guys have a plan. Well, I'm hoping that I can try to swing it in my favor somehow. I know Methuselah and Seeker were speaking a bit about that as well, but if you're worried about keeping your grip on this form, there may be something I can do to help. It doesn't last a long time, but if you feel yourself slipping away, try to stay close to me and... In an emergency, I have a spell that I can use that may temporarily protect you from the Marquis's influence. It, it grants protection from creatures such as Fae and could potentially allow you to remain centered. Would this spell work on something as powerful as an Archfey? Well, I'm not sure, to be honest, but I am willing to try, of course. It would have to be an emergency situation. It only lasts for ten minutes, but I imagine that would be potentially enough time for you to center yourself and focus on positivity. Right. Thank you. Do my best to let you know if I think that I will be here for it long. And then Mortis kneels down and places a hand on Thorn's shoulder. You must know, no matter what form you're in, I always see the true you. You will never be alone. Helping you has been my life's purpose since the day I met you. And if it takes the rest of my life, I will find some way to stop the Marquis. He nods. Thank you. This is all a lot. I mean, I don't know you guys as well as the other Thorn does, but thank you. No matter which Thorn you are, you are still yourself, and I still care for you. And then he's gonna open his arms up for a hug because he doesn't want to, like, pull Thorn into it. Thorn will give you a hug. It's a little bit more awkward than the other Thorn hugging you. And when he eventually pulls out of it, he goes, Well, let's go kick some druid butt. Indeed, my friend. Uh, Methuselah, do you know of anybody in this group that might have a tinder box? Oh, I do. Although, I'm not sure how effective it will be. It's very old. It's been with me for, in my pocket, for very long. So I don't know if it's going to be good. All right, well, would you mind if I borrowed it? And if it, if it doesn't work, that's fine, I suppose. Sure. I'll give you the tinderbox. Aw, oh, thank you, Methuselah. You're a great friend. With that, you guys situate yourselves, steal yourselves, and then leave the room. You are now at the same place, at the mouth of this cavern, this destruction that leads into the grove itself. You see the woods, the shrubbery, plants, even from the outside, from the surface, that has meticulously been planted and cared for in here. Despite the fact that there is no natural light, just a weird glow here and there to provide enough light 
sheepishly nourish the plants. The thing that stands out the most are the briar trees, tall and pale, that stretches throughout the grove. You guys proceed into the grove. There's not a real trail. There's not a real planned passageway through the woods. There's only the vegetation. Just wondering if we could do a perception to see if there's anything of notice, if there's any more goblins in hiding. Sure, go right ahead. I got an 18. I got a 16. Thorn got a 6. Thorn might be a little bit too distracted. Maybe even with the anxiety upon the situation that Thorn is in. But they proceed forward. The other two do proceed gingerly looking for danger. You guys do notice shaking and motion here and there. But honestly, you don't know if it is small animals or maybe monsters that are hiding nothing has stood out for you guys but as we're like walking and looking around and seeing the shaking can i go towards erky and ask him a question you do try to get close to erky it is very important to say that due to the fact that this is mostly vegetation think that you are going through a hike a hike with an extremely close and tight forest it literally hinders your pace and makes you walk slower. Carefully, you do get yourself beside Erky, and he's doing his best to keep up. I saw you with the, uh, the journals that we found last night. Did you uncover anything interesting? I mean, there's a lot about the past in those. It's gonna require me to actually to sit down and read them thoroughly, but do you have anything specific? Throughout this hike of sorts, he kind of explains to you what the last journal had in store. The journal basically details the transitional period of Mojin T's last experiment. Um, through her research and extensive attempts, she was capable to increase her strength, speed, and abilities that goes beyond the limits of a living and most undead, actually. As now Mojin T unlocked the secrets to artificially transform herself into the fabled, or what at least Erky believes to be the fabled creature known by the general public as a vampire. Though um, these achievements that she accomplished was no longer tied to most of her living limitations, she could figure it out how to bring back the Dark Warden, no matter how long it took, now that she was undead. Although it seems that her activities and experiments with the undead has not gone unnoticed, looking further into that passage with the devil she got the attention of something, something that was supposed to intervene with her plans. And that's when he had to use most of his knowledge as a cleric. And his theory about the prophecy that the devil was saying basically entails the arrival of, and then he looks at Mortis, a member of the Ashen Cloaks. He doesn't know anything else beyond that, but all that entails is that an Ashen Cloak must have caught the wind of the undead creatures that she must have been using. Some of the skeletons must be bodies that she was collecting and just left here and now it's being used by Belak. I want to say that Mortis was listening to this conversation as they were talking about it and then as he mentions that the Ashen Cloaks once had a presence here, he kind of perks up. Interesting. It seems to be a thing of destiny for me to return to this place and potentially to complete that crusade of times past. Oh yes, when I heard that, I quickly had to put it in my song, just because I thought it was so narrative. So you did also realize that it was an Ashen Cloak? Yes, I did. Nevertheless, I do hope that the first Ashen Cloak that arrived did finish the job. I mean, vampires are full of stories and embellishment that even the most of reliable accounts may not be entirely truthful. I never faced one and I don't know anybody who has truly done so to another. The only thing that appears in all other tales about vampires is the reliability of how to use a wooden stake blessed by a cleric to actually kill the vampire. Although we are in a forest, I don't know if any of these would be reliable when my powers are somewhat limited. I could try to bless it, but I don't know. I have a stake. Zula <laughs> takes that out and is like, I really don't remember how this got here, but I have one just in case. So if you have any spells that could 
provide holy light, we could take down this vampire if needed. The fact that you have that is both convenient and spooky. I really don't remember. I might have been drunk or something. You didn't recover that memory when you encountered the shade? Unfortunately, drunken memories are still a haze. A shame. Well, uh, like I said, I hope that the vampire was killed to begin with. But I guess we're prepared if we have to. You guys then proceed. Finally reach a weird clearing. You guys are just at the edge of this clearing. But on this clearing, it's really hard for you guys not to notice. Two skeletons. One leaning on another briar tree. While the other one is on the ground to the side covered completely by a grayish cloak that has suffered with time. What do you guys do? Is there any sigils on the cloaks that we can see? Or is it just a gray cloak? Just a gray cloak. Seeker is going to pull their rapier in one paw and then one of their daggers in the other, just so that they're ready in case a fight starts. Can Methuselah throw the stake at the skeletons? A wooden stake flies and hits one of the two skeletons. Which one? Say the one with the cloak. I just want to make sure that they're not alive. It hits the cloaked skeleton that is lying on the side on the ground. And it just hits the skeleton and pushes it mostly forward. Well, I think we're clear. Without saying anything, Mortis is going to slowly approach the skeleton, still very much on his guard. As you approach the one with the cloak, you get a better view of the entire area. This seems like it was interaction between the two. For... The one that is leaning against the tree is sitting with their back on the tree, but in one of the hands is clutching a broken shaft. From what I can tell, they seem to have been killed many, many, many years ago. The why they have been kept here is beyond me. Could we do an investigation on these skeletons to see if there's anything, you know, of note? If they have any notes or items or anything of value? Sure, go right ahead. I got a dirty 20. Thorn got a 9. Methuselah got a 16. Mortis got a 6. He's not really paying attention. Well, Mortis is also paying attention to the environment and make sure that no enemies are going to approach. Thorn is just looking at this entire situation in a very cautious manner. Meanwhile, Methuselah and Seek take a closer look at both the skeletons. By turning the skeleton on the ground, you guys notice the very botched and old leather armor underneath one skeleton that you imagine must have been some sort of like humanoid. An elf would be your best guess. The other one is stout, very short. This must have been a very built individual. The clothes mostly of leather and pieces of armor but it has a belt across its chest all botched and dirty with time funny though you guys notice that some articles of their wares are not hindered by time they gleam almost as if it was new these would be the braces on the one with the great cloak and the actual belt that the other has as well as pamphlet that is hanging from the belt of the one sitting down. The seeker wants to loot this shit. Easily you grab the braces. The glistening silver-like lines on these braces is, is not decorative. When you pull it, a dagger comes. Small. Enough to fit on the bracer. Well, well, I like this. Uh, should we check out the other stuff, Methuselah? Yes, I suppose so. Can I check out the belt? Sure. As you approach, you notice that the belt is this beautiful leather with this very big, geometrically stylized face of a very bearded humanoid. You can pick it up. I want to take it off and do some sort of investigation or history or arcana to figure out what this item is. I'll allow the history and arcana, Seeker. I would like to look at the pan flute. Before you do it, as Methuselah is approaching the other skeleton for the belt, the dagger on your hand just disappears. But then you look at the bracer, and where you pull the dagger, there's another silver line. A 13. This is clearly magical. It not only sustains itself against the period of time, not only how it sustains itself against the test of time, but because of how it 
glows against the many multiple ghostly lights within this room, this environment. This room, with your knowledge and lore about the world around you through music and tales, this best reminds you of belts worn by the mightiest of dwarven kind in the lands of Stopenstein down the south. Belts that apparently invigorate those who wield gives them strength, power, and a luscious beard. I'm gonna approach Mortis and be like, but I've heard uh, songs and stories about some items used to enhance abilities and give one strength. This one in particular might be good for you, most importantly. I've heard it gives the most luscious of beards to those who, who use it. Mortis kind of gestures to like the beard extension that he wears and takes it off. Oh, well, I suppose it's a more elegant solution. And then he tosses it aside. I'm gonna give you the belt to put on. Mortis is gonna take a moment to equip the belt. First, it feels like it wouldn't go past, not to say only your waist, but also the rest of your shell. But as with each pull to make sure to see if it fits, it almost as if it stretches until it fits perfectly around your waist and shell. Sturdy as well, quite comfortable against your skin. And you do start to feel the magic, start to feel the power. When slowly, you notice something itching against the very bottom of your shin. And slowly but surely, small, thin, gray hairs start to poke out, concentrated mostly at the chin. As it then elongates, the rest it gives you a nice, trimmed, almost like grayish beard. Mortis just starts kind of stroking the beard. Huh, wonderful. I always wondered what it was like to have an actual beard. Uh, you know, the, ex the extensions are one thing, but you know. Now I suppose you could say I look my age. <laughs> Which is not a day over 200, I imagine. <laughs> Indeed, my friend. Seeker, you approach to see the pipes. You have unfortunately no idea what these pipes are. Must be magical, but aside from that, you don't know. Uh, hi Methuselah, you're, you're a bard, you know music. Yes, these seem like pipes that someone would play, you know, a while ago. I actually remember Thorn played on like a pan flute a while ago. I'm remembering that right, aren't I? I believe so, yes, he carried it around with him. I do have a pan flute. Perhaps you could try this one out to see what it does. And Thorn will take the pan flute and he'll try to use Arcana or History to determine what the heck it is. Go for it. I got an 18. Nice. You look around. You try to see the inscriptions on the sides on each tube. Start to play a little bit. Test it out. Not only sounds beautiful, but also makes things move around you, in the shrubbery. You try, stop, and the movement stop. Try again, until you notice three little mouths approaches, as if it heard by your song. And the more you play, the more mice appear. Thorn starts playing and is looking at the mice around him, and looks at Mortis and goes, sorry. Before Mortis can react, Seeker is going to pounce. One of them doesn't stand a chance while all the others run back to the shrubbery. Oh, uh, sorry, Thorn. Yeah, instinct. It's okay. I guess I could use this to distract someone and he'll place it on his person. Well, you know, as long as they stay on our side, could be a useful thing to have. You know what they say, the enemy of my enemy and all that. Methuselah's gonna play a very sad song for the poor unfortunate mouse who got, uh, pounced on. <laughs> the seeker does eat the mouse that they pounced on. They're not they're not gonna waste a perfectly good mouse. I'm still playing the sad little ditty for this unfortunate mouse who has fallen to a great hero. With the end of that sad song, you guys proceed, going further into the grove with newfound magical light. of the 
the Sunless Citadel. Thank you so much for listening. Subscribe to us on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. And be sure to catch the next installment of the Sunless Citadel every Thursday at 12 p.m. EST. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review. It's a small way to show your support that goes a long way. To connect with us, follow our social media accounts, and if you'd like to support us, you can head over to our Patreon to join the conversation, view sneak peeks of our next project, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Our intro score was created by Patrick Corton from Off the Beaten Path Musical. The Sunless Citadel can be found in the Tales from the Yawning Portal by Wizards of the Coast. The world of Nasso Mundus was created by Pedro Stockler. Thanks again for listening from all of us at the Storytellers Tavern.